We have uh, facilities all around the country. We have different demographics around the country. We have different payer mixes because it's healthcare. So um, it's not the singular customer. Uh, so that's exciting. So we get to ch- we get to write, create, educate on a regular basis all around the country and get to learn so much about these unique, dynamic micro. I call them micro markets because we are. We're, we're not e-commerce. We're still physical retail. You have to walk in to, to generate revenue. Welcome to How I Made It in Marketing from Marketing Sherpa. We scour pitches from hundreds of creative leaders and uncover specific examples. Not just trending ideas or buzzword-laden schmaltz. Real-world examples to help you transform yourself as a marketer. Now, here's your host, the Senior Director of Content and Marketing at Marketing Sherpa, Daniel Burstein, to tell you about today's guest. I think here's one of the biggest challenges for you when you grow in your career. When you get into a certain role, you and others as well, you've got this general idea of how someone should be in that role. Let's call that the central casting version of a CMO. And yet, in my life... I've been more successful when I've been able to take off that mask and be as much of my true, authentic self as possible in my life, even in my work life. Our next guest is here to talk about that overcoming imposter syndrome, avoiding the marketing buzzword vomit dump. Oh my gosh, I love hearing that though. I'll say that again, the marketing buzzword vomit dump that can coincide with budget bragging and many more lesson-filled stories. So thank you for joining us today, David Apple, the Chief Marketing Officer of Intuitive Health. Uh, great to be here, Daniel. Thank you very much. Having a great day. So let's just um, cherry pick from your background a bit. Sure. Let people know who uh, we're listening to. You were the Director of Business Development at CBS Television Stations Group. You were the CMO of Augme Technologies. And for the past eight years, you have been the CMO of Intuitive Health. Intuitive Health treated 467,000 patients in 2022. And Apple, you are responsible for a $10 million marketing budget, including joint ventures. So give us uh, an idea. What is your day like as a CMO of Intuitive Health? I I typically uh, beg for more money on a regular basis, as any (laughs) any marketer should. Uh, No, we're we're, uh, we're a really dynamic group. We're a pretty small company, uh, fast-paced growth company. Um, So... uh, as a preferred model, uh, I, a model I prefer is you know no day is the same. Right? So we we have uh, facilities all around the country. We have different demographics around the country. We have different payer mixes because it's healthcare. So um, it's not the singular customer. Uh, so that's exciting. So we get to ch- we get to write, create, educate on a regular basis all around the country and get to learn so much about these unique, dynamic micro, I call them micro markets because we are, we're, we're not e-commerce. We're still physical retail. You have to walk in to, to generate revenue um, so that, that it's very old fashioned capture the consumer uh, at that moment. So it, it, no, no two days are alike, not to use that common cliche, but it really isn't. Um, we, we look at the challenges and we, uh, we are um, performance centric on a daily basis. And what that means is we look at volume, we look at performance and, and quite a few key numbers that we can get into um, on a daily basis. So it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a militant type of operation you look at the you look at the 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 daily uh, workload we're 24 7 every single one of our facilities never closes so that's another you know dynamic so you're you are always on but we're looking at those daily numbers on a regular basis and 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 reacting and building um from there yeah it's great i think there's a lot of health car- healthcare marketers that can learn from you but also just people with physical brick and mortar locations, sure. franchisees, because that's kind of similar to what you're doing. People interested in joint ventures, you know, brand partnerships. So I think there's a lot we can learn. But one thing I did want to mention when you when you talked about budgets, so we used to have marketing Sherpa, we would have uh, benchmarks of all different things. And, you know, every year we would ask marketers, you know, what's your biggest challenge? And it didn't matter if the economy was booming or if the economy was doing horrible, whatever was going on, the number one challenge was always like, my budget's not big enough. Yeah. <laughs> my budget's not big enough. Isn't that so funny? Um, but it's what you do with your budget. Not It's not the size of your budget. It's, it's what you do with it. So let's talk about what you've been able to do with it and what lessons you've learned in your career. Uh, so the first lesson to talk about from some of the things you made in your career, you said there is a big difference between 10 years of experience and 10 years of experiences. 
So what do you mean by that, and, and how'd you learn that? Well, that's the excuse I had to make because I wasn't an Ivy League guy. Nobody was going to pick me up because of academics. Um, I'm sure I could have been straight A's my whole an, entire life and, and graduated some prestigious college, but I, I must have made those uh, uh, choices uh, differently at some, somewhere along the lines. But I realized that the this ability to be a curious learner and listener um, was puts you in situations um, where you can gain some key, key experience. Uh, you know, I did all of my education in New York City, um, was with the big guys, the big agencies, um, was part of a CBS uh, television stations group when they were transitioning to this big digital rollout and model. And we were consolidating radio, TV, multimedia, all into one really specific um, platform. And if you, if, you, if you sat back and you took that as an experience, not a job, um, and you got to listen to these great agencies and these great content developers and um, even just the great sales, you know, sales guys and leaders on how they um, address those. You say, this is an experience that I know for a fact I'm going to take through the rest of my career. And it was. Uh, And I I always kind of was you know, big advocate and felt a little bit upset when people didn't look at it that way because it's, it's free education. I mean, this is, this is, this is cutting your teeth with the, with the big guys. And, um, you know, it's sitting in a, in a meeting with the NCAA and listening to how that really works. So you could say, this is a terrible organization. Um, that's not about kids, athletics, academics, or anything like that, that on the surface, you could, you could probably say that, but if you really sit down and listen to how it works, or you could take advantage of it. That's an experience that that is um, that is learned and earned on 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 a really regular basis. And and uh, so I, I realized that I'm you know again I wasn't going to be picked out of a crowd because of you know my Harvard degree. I was going to be picked out of a crowd because I had real experience. I was able to take zero revenue, make it 10 million, make it 56 million, make it 80 million and have a plan and deliver a plan um, and execute on it. So it's really it's 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 kind of an excuse. It's kind of a way out of saying, hey, I got, you know, uh, I've been doing this for for 20 years. But let me tell you what I've been doing for 20 years. The experiences are pretty broad. Um, So that's really that's really how I, um, you know, address that. And as you get older, you kind of. I think, you you know, I'm, I'm 46 now. I've been doing this. Um, I started at CBS when I was 22 and really never took my foot off the gas. Um, and you, you're you still pulling from those experiences, right? And uh, every single day, no matter where, where you go, and, and, you, and you have better ways of dealing with uh, adversity and challenges because of those uh, experiences. I take that all day long. I never really understood companies who could say, you know, uh, these it, mobile, I worked in, in mobile technology. We can get into that a little bit. But, you know, it's funny to me is we're, we're sitting at, you know, smartphone penetration at 5, 10%. Right in the early days of the Apple One iPhone, and all these companies were emerging, and these agencies were hiring uh, uh, mobile um, groups, and they would say, "We have 15 years of mobile experience," and you're going, "What are you talking about? <laughs> like we're we're not even we haven't even defined what this space is yet. You know, um, we can't even deliver content yet to all the phones, and you're telling me there's somebody out there with 15 years uh, of experience. Um, how about somebody with two years of hardcore?" experiences in mobile, actually delivering the content and delivering results. I always thought that played better. So I always had trouble understanding um, just the listed experience. Well, I like what you're saying. And a lesson I've learned in my career is especially like when you're going through the most painful times in your career, like going through layoffs and and all these other things, like having to lay off people in your company. And I've learned that, you know, like this, a good, good way to look at it is to reframe it as well, this is an education. This is a horrible thing to go through and, and maybe never want to go through it again or especially feel empathy for the other people going through it with you. But boy, there is an education here and I'm learning, you know, it's one thing as, uh, you know, when, when the times are good and all the boats are floating pretty high, you know what I mean? It's one thing to be successful then, but to be successful when it's really hitting the fan, to be successful in a really tough economy. I think we both lived through the kind of 2008, 2009 downturn in our career. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, I always looked at that as like, man, this is, this is the hard-earned lessons I'm, I'm going to get. So I really like what you're saying there. And maybe someone listening might be going through something difficult and maybe it will help them to kind of reframe it and understand it that way of like, this is where I'm going to get the lessons when the times are tough. Um, but I want to ask you another, another version of experiences because this is something I've done in my career. What about your experiences as a customer? Like, has that ever informed a campaign or a brand or a product? And I'll give you a specific example from my career here real quick. Is uh, yeah, I wrote about uh, customer first marketing should prioritize the customer experience over mm-hmm. upsells because I would go into Barnes & Noble. I love Barnes & Noble. I love magazines, newspapers, that physical experience. And every time I would purchase, they would try to upsell me on the membership hard, you know, the cashier. And I realized, you know, the, the value proposition here, the differentiation between Amazon and Barnes & Noble, because I could easily just buy subscriptions to these things online is... Is there that experience? I'm walking in, I'm smelling the coffee, I'm getting the physical newspaper, whatever it is, and they're just undercutting that experience by trying to upsell me each time. Let that cashier, who's probably passionate about the same things I am, you know, magazines, newspapers, reading, let them have a real human connection so it's different from Amazon, you know. Uh, So I just wonder for you, like as a customer, we talk about experiences, yes, our our experiences in, in our business career and our work life, but as a customer, has that ever influenced any campaign or product you rolled out? 100%. So I have quite a few examples of that, but I'll give you one that's key and kind of close to home. You think about, um, you know, what intuitive health does. We we have a a really specific value proposition. We're a a dual model emergency room and urgent care under one roof, and we build in really specific trade areas. So the places that you are comfortable going, getting your groceries, going, um, you know, getting your massage and, you know, going to Home Depot, you can get care now and you don't have to, and it's easy, it's accessible, um, it's full service, it's a high attention to customer customer service. We can get into all the, the training mechanisms and the components to that, but, it's, but it's, it has to be true. So the problem with healthcare today is the brand is a lie, right? So the, the, the expectations of healthcare is low. So Daniel, you're sick, your son is sick, or your, your daughter is, is sick, you're having a crappy day. Your expectations of walking through that door at a, at a hospital are super low. And, you know, you're going to be disappointed for the, for the, for the most part. We, we can accept that. I think we can all unanimously say that's kind of the general sense. We're transitioning that 100%. We'll get into that. But if you think as a consumer... Um, I had, you know, quite a journey. I, we were moving from Texas back to New Jersey in 2012, um, getting ready to close on a house that we're going to tear down and rebuild. I got a young family, Hurricane Sandy hits or Superstorm Sandy by the time it hit New Jersey, destroys the house that we're supposed to be moving into. So we come back to Texas homeless basically we rent a, we rent a home we, we were literally looking for a house as we were driving back to texas we find a home in in frisco texas um about a mile from our first intuitive location um ironically right no that wasn't planned we have no furniture um i put a couple chairs up in the kitchen um so me and the kids are eating at the counter uh my young son uh jumps up on the on the chair to, you know, get on my lap. He's two years old. He falls over, breaks his foot broken. hundred percent. We know it's broken. It swells up. You know, the kid doesn't cry. He doesn't, he's got that high threshold for pain as a two year old. Oh man, it's broken. Okay. I grab him. I'm calming him down. My wife goes and packs an overnight bag of clothes, blankets, food, everything because her expectation and my expectation is I'm going to walk through the hospital door and I'm going to be there until the sun comes up. You know, it's eight o'clock at night. I'm going to be there until early in the morning, right? That's everybody's expectations. I said, before I go to the hospital, I'm going to go down to that little place on the corner. It says it's an emergency room. It says it's open 24 hours. Let me just give it a try. And she said, you are not taking our son to that little dock in the box thing. They're going to do something and they're going to screw up everything. I said, I have to, I have to try. I'm not staying at the hospital all night. Okay. Cause in, back in our day, right. We would just wrapped it in a, we just wrapped it in a, in a blanket or something or put some ice on it and just walked it off. Right. <laughs> Walk it off. Walk it off. Right. Take some aspirin. Yeah. yeah. So 
I go down to this little place, low expectations. We just talked about that, right? Thinking it's going to be, no, they're not going to know what to do. I walk through the door. The lady behind the front desk, there's no glass partition. There's no nothing. She's dressed normal. She's got a huge smile on her face. She says, oh, give me that baby. Let me, let me, let me get him. She grabs, takes him from me. She's rocking him. She gets him a lollipop. She's hanging out with him. Walks right through the, the door down back to the, puts him in a room. We have an x-ray. Daniel, in 45 seconds, we were in the x-ray uh, machine. Everybody was playing with them. Nurses, doc, doctors, everybody was coming in, calming them down. Within, within 15 minutes, we had full x-ray. We had splints started. I was back in my house in 45 minutes. Wow. I wasn't even I didn't even care about his foot anymore. I said I handed him back to my wife. I said, You're never gonna believe what, what just happened. That place is gonna be on the corner of every corner in America. It was awesome. It was exactly what it should be. This is gonna change the world. And from there, that's where you know, that's where my journey with intuitive started. Because believe it or not, and this is probably for another podcast, but I forced myself in here. I said, These guys are gonna raise money. I'm gonna keep an eye on it. They raised capital. I literally came over here, knocked on the door and said, I'm going to be your chief marketing officer. And they said, we don't need a chief marketing officer. I said, you, you will. I'm going to, I'm going to be the chief marketing officer. So that's how I got the job here. Basically. Um, I kind of forced my way in because I was such a believer in the model and it's as a believer because I was a consumer first. And throughout this company, you will find that on a pretty regular basis where they, where they tried the experience and they said, wow, this is different. I understand this. I am in this industry and we, and they, um, and they, and they got here through that path. So that, I mean, that's an amazing story. And I think that's a good lesson there for anyone also interested, interested in franchisee marketing, right? Which is essentially, sure. I know it's probably don't call it that, but it's very similar to what I see franchisees do. But I think the other lesson I, I think about when you talk about that is, and this applies to really everyone outside of healthcare too, any, any industry is there are a lot of costs outside of the monetary cost for our products and services. And a lot of times we overlook that, like you said, for healthcare. So yes, if you need to go to emergency room or urgent care, there's gonna be that price of it. You know what I mean? There's gonna be, you know, maybe your insurance covers it, maybe it doesn't, however that works, right? But one reason that sometimes, and I, what's funny when you said that, I really even thought about it. one reason I've sometimes not gone in the middle of the night or just kind of waited is because of the cost of the horrible experience you're about to endure, the time, sure. the friction, the, all those things you're going through. So I think that's a great lesson too for everyone going through and thinking about, you know, your experience as a customer going through your product or service purchase or just even experience with the product and thinking beyond that monetary cost and what you can do to reduce friction and anxiety. Well, yeah. And if you think it's just one point on that, because you're, you're absolutely right. If you, you think about the mo- like our model it, and any model retail, it's time and money, right? What are consumers most upset about that you took advantage of? Is their time and their money? Right, and it's no different in, in for what we do. So it's really at the pinnacle. I mean, you look at our tagline: "It's right care, right price, close to home." And that's that's it. It's there's nothing else to 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 share there. It's a pretty simple proposition. It's changing healthcare. That takes a little bit more education and a little bit more convincing. But it's it's really simple because it's time and money. Yeah, well, and I'll give you one other quick example, not healthcare related. And this was during the height of the pandemic. So in fairness, that might have made things more difficult. Uh, you know, we're going to pick up food because you can't, you know, um, you know, eat at places really at that time. And so we go, there's this big upscale luxury mall near me called St. John's Town Center. And so me and my kids wanted Chipotle, but my wife wanted, I won't name the, it was an upscale, you know, restaurant that was uh-huh. cost 10 times Chipotle or whatever. And so we go, we grab the Chipotle, boom. And then we go, you know, they're supposed to have this drive up and, you know, give you the food type of thing. We go and we wait there. My, my daughter came with me. We're, I think, 45 minutes at least for this food that's supposed to be ready, you know, right away. We order at the same time in Chipotle. And she called out this one. I didn't even know it's this huge thing of the experience. She's like, once we got it, she's like, do you notice how on the Chipotle bag it has a specific time when it's going to be ready and it didn't have it on the bag for this other <laughs> restaurant? Yeah. And I was like, that's a great insight. I was like, I'm not, is that had nothing to do with the monetary cost. I'm like, I am not putting myself through that time cost again. That is just not worth it. That's right. Um, Let's talk about another lesson here. You mentioned 
fancy terms can lead to bigger missed expectations. So how did you learn this lesson? Yeah, I, you know, I was, uh, I was always really nervous about this part because I think this is, this kind of plays in the role of, you know, the imposter syndrome too, is as you grow in your career and you, and you go, do I match up with, you know, these people I'm going to be working with? I have an exceptional amount of responsibility now. And I have a exceptional amount of re- revenue responsibility and job responsibility. And people work work for me, and you know, can I keep up? And and I always thought that the difference between somebody kind of trying to space their sel- themselves from the the daily grind and the people executing the daily grind was the fancy terms. And you know, I had this really unique experience where um, Augme Technologies, where we were a mobile startup and, you know, things were really going well. And we, we, we got an in to these major CPG brands, the big ones, all of them, Kellogg's, Kimberly Clark, Sara Lee. Uh, I mean, you name it, we were, we were, working, uh, we were working with them because we were solving a very specific, you know, problem. Now, you think about it was recession time, 2008, you know, housing bust you know, a lot of these big CPG companies were laying off, you know, every day in the news, 1,500, 2,000 people. It was, it was kind of, a, it was actually more exciting to be at a startup, I think, than it was to be at a, at a big, safe, you know, CPG company. Um, and so everybody was on edge, it, which they should be, right? Everybody was looking for job security. And mobile was the answer that everybody needed because that was going to be the new delivery methodology for um, content and branding, you know, as it is today, right? So it's, we, not that we predicted it would be this big, but we predicted this would be a, a very sophisticated channel. So we, we ran into a lot of, um, you know, chief marketing officers, big strategy title people at the CPG companies who were trying to out vocabulary us on a pretty regular basis. Like, you don't know what you're doing. You're just a small startup. We're the big brand. We have all of the power. And we're going to and we're gonna use these terms to make you, f- make you ask, I don't understand what that is. Because as soon as you say that, then I have the advantage. You know, and it, so it felt like we were running into that a lot. And in the end of the day, if you put a, uh, you know, maybe a financial calculator, you look at a, you look at a, 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 a timeline, there was a lot of mixed expectations in that. So it seemed like the more pushback we got from people who weren't willing to partner, work together, solve the problem together, um, the, the, the bigger the missed, ex, you know, missed expectations. And, and honestly, I, I don't even know if I just personally, I just don't have any patience for it. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty contrarian, you know, when it comes to, to these types of things. I'm like, just, just say what it is. Don't make me don't make me Google the word just because it makes you feel important that you have a you know, leg up on, on, on the word, especially when it relates to, you know, a specific technology or a process that we're all going to work on together. We, we can keep it simple. We don't have to we don't have to get too complicated. Um, so, I, I, you know, I don't have any you know hard statistics, but a lot of the people that met us, um, uh, you know, head on and were, were, were pretty challenging to us who really specifically wanted to show their clout using you know, the fancy terms um, uh, r- did not work out uh, very often, um, you know, in the end. So well, what advice would you give for someone having to work with someone like that? So I think it's easy at the CMO level. The advice is don't hire them. And, and for, you know, where sure. I've seen it happen more is with consultants, right? <laughs> you know, where it's like, oh, my gosh, this consultant is, is just kind of like trying to make it sounds like they know what they're talking about. But they don't really. But let's say if you're, you know, kind of more junior in your career and you're working in an agency, you've got to work with people or at a vendor, you've got to work with people that's brand or, or vice versa. You're stuck working with people that's agency or consultant and you see this going on. Do you have any advice, to, you know, having lived that of, of how can you handle that and still be successful? Yeah, I, I do a little bit. And whether it's good advice or not, I don't, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you just go up there and you just smack the crap out of them and you shake them <laughs> and you just say, shut up. You know, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> don't do that. But um, no, I, I, you know, one of my, the repetitive themes that I have is, is people. I mean, I'm here because of people, my mentors and people I've met and, 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 and the, the characters, the cast of characters that I've, you know, been involved in for sure. And I think if um, the way I handle it now is obviously there's certain level of maturity now and kind of comfort in who I am you know, versus maybe back in those days. 
Um, when we all were striving for job security and we didn't know if we were going to have homes and paychecks the next week, it was a kind of a scary um, time. But now my, my advice would be you can learn something from everybody, hands down. Be patient with people. Um, if somebody is really using that as a way to create power, to sit higher in their chair, um, they have, there's, there might be some fundamental flaws there. But let them talk. There's gonna, they're going to say something that you can take. Um, you know, we can learn something f- just as much from the from the harder relationship as we can from the from the better relationships. Um, and we deal with it on a on a regular basis now. Um, and we have some young team members, and and uh, and and you know, we're working with massive health systems, huge, huge, the the biggest in the country. Um, and there's a lot of people who do these things that, you know, you guys are just a small company. You have no idea how challenging this. And we, and we just say, look, this is how it's going to be. We're not going to challenge this person's character. We're going to listen. We're going to empower them. And once we make them feel important and listened to, it usually calms down, honestly. Once they've established the pecking order, um, we usually see a real transition in kind of character um, and, you know, lack of a better term, pushiness. And, you know, they, they kind of feel more collaborative once they feel like they have the control back and they've reestablished, you know, the, the, that pecking order and that hierarchy. Um, so to, to me, it's, you know, hey, we can learn. We, we say it all the time. We have a very, uh, we have a um, servant leadership culture here. Uh, and we talk about, you know, we don't bash any of our customers, even the toughest, even the, t- the toughest characters. We say, hey, they're making us better. You know, and I think that every single one of those relationships can make you better if you leverage it um, the right way. So that'd be the advice I give. Don't, you know, don't shut down. You know, stay true to your, stay true to your passions and your and your callings. But listen, you know, keep those ears open because there's they they do have typically have the experiences um, that you can leverage for sure. And I imagine, and this ties into the next lesson I want to ask you about is also might be specifically being in the healthcare industry. So I haven't worked in that industry as much, but working in the tech industry where I do not have an engineering background or those mm-hmm. things, there's definitely also, it's not just from other marketers, it's from technical people of like, well, wait a minute, <laughs> like, do you even know these things and you're a marketer and coming in here? So I'd imagine healthcare could be the same with, you know, especially an industry that doesn't even know marketing as much could, could have this, the same issue. So I want to ask you about this next lesson. Um, and, I, and I'd imagine that whole imposter syndrome can tie in there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you say, make it work. And uh, one of the things that I really appreciated when I saw, you know, just so people listening understand, we get, I think we've gotten like 2,300, 2,600 applications so far. This is going to be an episode in the 50s, you know, oh, cool. 53, 54, something like that. So, you know, we get a lot of these applications. And one of the things that really stuck out to me about yours, not just the humility and, and the lessons you're, you're clearly explaining right now, but um, I had read in Florida Trend Magazine about, I didn't know Intuitive Health was a company involved in it, but it was a, a major local healthcare brand, hospital brand, that was opening this new uh, type of thing down the road from my house. And it was a mixture of an urgent care center and an emergency room. And it was basically like, you got a problem, you just come here and we'll build you properly. You know, mm-hmm. like not, if you're not sure, like, should I go to the ER for that? <laughs> should I go to the, you know, urgent care for that? We'll build you properly, you just come in. And what really struck me about that was there, I have not seen much of a unique value proposition in the, I guess, I don't know what's called healthcare services or patient services field. Like obviously when it comes to technology, when it comes to drugs, yes, a patent, you have some unique value yeah. proposition or medical device, but actually in that healthcare services, it's always so difficult. Who, who do I choose? You know what I mean? It's very not patient focused. Uh, all the things you mentioned, very not cost focused. So when I saw that, that, that just jumped out at me, right? Like, wow, there is a unique value proposition you know, for this type of thing. And it is, it seems more kind of customer first marketing, the things we talk about, which I haven't seen in that field. So I want to ask you when it comes to making it work, you mentioned you came in like many franchises, maybe when it was a one location, mm-hmm. now you're rolling this out across the country. You're rolling this out in an industry to kind of tie back into what you were just saying that is filled with healthcare professionals, not marketers, or maybe people that understand and the customer. You are also working in an industry where the people showing up are not always paying the majority or any of what of the cost because there's a third party payer. Sure. So give us a sense. Maybe there's one specific lesson in this. And how did you, as you say, make it work? 
Yeah. And, and it, it comes, it's, it's kind of two parts. And I, and I feel like you, that was a great explanation. So I appreciate you really understanding the model. I feel like if I could rip this microphone off, I would just drop the microphone and say, we're, we're, we're done here. We got it. <laughs> we're, we're good. Um, I finally reached a customer <laughs> after eight years. This is great. Um, it, it, it's, it was, it, it, the, one of the lessons was for me, one of the lessons was for, you know, this brand and this company. And the lesson for me was, um, maybe being from the Northeast and being that, you know, kind of, you know, especially growing up in New York City in those days, of early career. I mean, it was fast, 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 fast. You had to be first. And I had to learn patience because uh, and I and I learned this through some you know, really great mentors and great people to say, just don't accept the first answer. Just keep building, keep building. And, you know, it's funny. And that was hard for me to do. It really, it really was. And I, and I strongly suggest all marketers should, should do that, should collaborate and build and build on ideas because the, the third and fourth and fifth idea is way better than the first. Even if it was like the greatest aha moment ever, um, the fifth is going to be even more aha than the, than the first. It 100% works out that way. Um, so that was the first lesson was really the, the patience, let things build, ask the questions and, and, and build on the idea. Don't rush it out, uh, rush it out the door. And, and because also once you rush it out the door, it's everybody's. So someone can take that first iteration and then build on it and be like, I can't believe they missed all these great points to this. And now we're just going to build on it. Um, so, you know, deliver the best product for sure. 100%. But then the make it work as it was related to intuitive was you said, how could we, you know, how, how are we going to convince the Daniels of the world with, you know, kids and, and stuff that this is a safe place to go, right? And we had all this, you know, you think about when I joined the organization as a fresh capital raise, wild west, no idea how this is going to work. We, we don't have any IP. We, we don't. There's nothing. I mean, th- I'll, I'll tell you something that's going to probably blow your mind. We are a emergency room who chooses to build people who don't need emergency room at urgent care. We're making that choice. If you went to a healthcare executive, they say, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. If you're going to see 100 patients, why not just bill 100 patients emergency room? You're not doing anything illegally. We're saying we're doing something ethically illegal, right? That person just had the flu. Why are we going to charge them $1,900 in facility fee because of the flu? So it's, it's a stupid idea, Daniel. I mean, it's a stupid <laughs> idea to everybody trying to make a living in, in healthcare, right? But we said, we're customers. It's a fantastic idea. And people will, you know, people will understand it. So we, when I came in, uh, even our equity group said, you know, marketing can't influence the healthcare decision. And I said... Maybe, maybe not, but we're not talking about healthcare decision. We're talking about retail healthcare decision. You add retail on there, people are making their own choice to come through that door. I guarantee you we can influence that choice. That's a marketing problem. Now we can now we can do it. And by the way, here in, in Texas, I'll give you another little stat that'll blow your mind. This is, you know, retail health. This is the Wild West here. This is the state with the easiest legislation. Florida's probably second. Colorado's in there, too. There's, we have six locations in North Texas, four in um, Central Texas now. But in the six locations in North Texas, uh, we have 480 competitors. And I am not counting hospitals. So in, in just in our drive time, our 13-minute drive time to these facilities, we have over 400 competitors. So I'm telling you, it's on every corner. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty significant. So to me, heck yeah, let's bring on a marketing problem because now you, no longer, you, you have accepted the fact that you can get urgent care and even emergency room care in these retail-sized facilities. We're talking 6,000, 10,000 square feet, not much bigger than a QSR you know, um, uh, facility, right? So they're, they're blended right in there. They're in the shadow of Whole Foods and Trader Joe's and, and, and Publix in Florida. You know, um, they're, they're right in the shadows. Of, now people are convinced we, the, the market has trained them. Now we have to influence them to our, to our brand over 
that brand. And it's the model that's the difference. So what we wanted to make work was educating the consumer on this dual model. You don't have to choose. And then you would say, consumer says, well, what you're going to do is you're just going to use the emergency, you're going to use the urgent care to lure me in. And then you're going to charge the emergency room. Okay. How do we make that messaging work? Well, here's the data. You know, we see 500,000 patients a year, 400,000 of them get billed at urgent care level. So those 100,000 patients are emergency room patients, true blue. It's not subjective, it's objective. We have an objective process to determine that. We're fully in network, meaning your insurance company and payer accepts that notion. So we had, so we had to really test. So you think about it's the, we can't really control cost, right? That's, that's one of the unique things about healthcare is like, we can't really control cost because it is the third payer model. You know, your employer has a specific contract with your, uh, uh, you know, insurance company. So we can't really say, oh, it's $15. You no, know, we're going to give you $15 off. We can't incentivize a visit. That's against the law. I can't say, hey, every, every time we see you in your family, Daniel, you get $10 off your next visit. That's a, you know, we'll all go to jail for that statement if we put it out. So, um, you know, we, we go into it. So we had it, we had to really make the content work and we had to prove it with data. We had to prove it with data and we had to prove it with experience. And that experience part is a whole nother, um, you know, element to it. So you think about this evolution, we're talking, we're talking years and we're still doing it. And even our private equity firm who said, you know, marketing doesn't influence. I mean, they told me, they said, hey, just come get us established. Put the put the components in place for a marketing you know, division. Hire your replacement and then move on to the next private equity back. Well, we're going to need you for 18 months. And that was eight years ago. Right. But I just, you know, we fell in love with the, the model and the growth. And we we were making an impact right off the bat. It was costing us about one hundred and twenty five dollars to acquire a new patient customer uh, when I started. And now we now we are sub twenty dollars in basically every single market. So and that's with twenty two to thirty percent same store sales growth year over year since since the beginning. Um, so and we're just driving, you know, costs down because that messaging and that service level has created that earned patient. So people are coming in. You, 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 how many kids, I don't know how many kids you, you have, but I have two, I have two kids. I have two. We mm-hmm. see, we see your size family 25 times a year because they're, because they, they go in, they, every sore throat, every head, cause it's no, cause it's a no brainer. You go there at the lunch break, the nurse, the school nurse tells you to go there. Hey, just bring little Joey over there. Tell him, just make sure, I just want to make sure it's not strep. He can come back to school in 20 minutes. He comes into our facility, he's done, for, you know, and, and he's back in school in 45 minutes. So people have just adopted this really simplistic, you know, uh, care um, component. And, and that's that's the result of the messaging plus the experience. So it's it's a, it's a, it's probably an over-explanation of, of the make it work. Um, <laughs> but, you, but you have to understand the there's still and there always will be this reluctance um, to to create loyalty with with healthcare because there isn't any. The brand means nothing on, on the side of a hospital. It's just where it's placed, right? It's the or closest. You know, it's it the the brand doesn't have as much equity as it does in a specific you know retail. But it's the fact that it's easy to get into. Time and money are consider you know are are being considered all the time, and then your satisfaction is being considered all the time yeah so uh first of all i mean i and this is very true for any industry that or, or anyone going through something where it's difficult to change an industry or it's difficult to change a company so i think there's a lot of lessons there but are you saying you your competition is as vast as going from a primary care doctor or pediatrician all the way to a hospital with an emergency room because that is a you know you, you talk about all those different types of customer segments that might be involved there yeah that's right that's right. So it's it's pediatrics to Medicare, right? I mean, it's 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 the full, um, it's the full gamut. But from a c- competition standpoint, I'm just I'm just speaking of urgent cares and freestanding emergency rooms. That's how many there are here in in Texas because because of the licensure and everything else uh, like that. I'm not even you you, you include you know uh, PCPs and everybody else into the mix. We're talking thousands of options for care in in Texas. It's probably the most accessible care state in the whole country by far. 
Well, let me ask you this question for the B2B marketers, right? Because we talked a lot about the B2C, but for the B2B marketers, so I know in this market, what, what drew my eye, like I said, I didn't even know Intuitive Health was a company behind it. I don't even know if that is how you're publicly messaging. Yep. Uh, you're messaging with a major local healthcare brand. Now, that major local healthcare brand has emergency rooms, <laughs> right? Yep. And so I would imagine just the way healthcare is set up, and I, again, I'm not a healthcare marketer, they're getting a certain percentage of the business no matter what, and they're charging emergency room rates for it. Uh, so how do you go into, and I think you, JV, you know, joint venture all around the country when you're introducing to these local markets, markets, which is great because that's helping in that local market. You've already got that, you know, trust with the healthcare provider, which I'd assume would be huge for something like healthcare, actually trusting, you know, who's going to, who's going to serve you there. Um, so how do you make that sale though, <laughs> to these groups that probably already have the emergency rooms, they're already going to get a certain percentage of the business. They can already charge that. Like, wait a minute, yeah, 80% of these people charge at the urgent care rate. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what typically happens is we're not building in the shadow of the, of their core emergency room, right? So, uh, out by you, it's University of Florida. It's a great, you know, great partnership. Um, we're building these away from the main hospital to gain market share, right? Because you might have two or three hospital options to, to get care, um, and so we're we're really strategically we put a lot of emphasis on location. We have a really sophisticated real estate selection process and um it's awesome um you know the the marketing teams evolve on that side as well because we want to make sure we have the right you know throughput and and we have these uh kind of core uh components that we look at from a from a location uh, standpoint you know proximity to schools and rooftops and you know the you, you know your home you know where, where the two plus uh kid homes are uh things like that so so it, it is a it is a really specific market share you know geography uh, grab. But you, you said another kind of core component to that is like why would they why would they want to do this? Well, if you think about you know transitioning an industry. We're talking about twelve thousand square foot facilities. There is nothing in a healthcare systems vocabulary that's twelve thousand square feet. They can't even think along those lines. And there, then then we tell them that in these 12 to 15 room facilities, which that's all they are, we're gonna push through 100, 125 patients a day in 45 minutes. And they go, that is crazy. Uh, you know, that just just can't happen. We, we, we push, it, it takes us, you know, it takes us hours and hours to get 60 patients through the, the hospitals. So we really sell them on this specific kind of, um, Brand awareness. So if you if you say, okay, now the closest front door you have to University of Florida, Daniel, now is our facility on Bay Meadows down, you know, close to, to your home. That's a great first impression to the broader UF brand. Now you go in there with your um, child and let's just say he's having trouble with his knee. He had a sports injury. You go in there, you have a great experience. And he says, hey, I have a great orthopedic. By the way, he's part of the UF system. And that you're going to recommend it to you. Boom. There's a nice, there, we, we have captured a patient. We're keeping them in the, the market. That would have never happened had you had drive, have to drive 45 minutes to the, to the main hospital. So now we've just captured another patient for the UF services. And if, and if God forbid it's more serious, which you know, we always hope it's not, um, we have a very easy transfer process. So you come into our facility and if it's cardio, stroke, something very, very um, high, what we call high acuity, you know, you've transferred very quickly, systematically right to the hospital um, you know, door, everything is transferred. It's, 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 it's easy access. So they are doing it with the intent of gaining more, um, patients and leaving, you know, potential revenue on the table with the urgent care always pays itself back in loyalty, right. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and recommendations and, and, um, and referrals for sure. So that's a great lesson there with anyone who's scared of cannibalizing their own offering because, you know, the business, uh, you know, textbooks are littered with companies that had a pretty strong position 
would not cannibalize our own offering and someone else came across to do it. So if you're in a similar industry facing that, I think there's some lessons there from David. Um, so in the first half of the podcast, we talked about lessons from the things you made. In the second half, we're going to talk about lessons from the things the people you made them with. That's a great thing mm-hmm. we get to do as marketers. We get to make things, you know, and like, I always say I've never been a podiatrist or an actuary, but you know, I've never been in those industries, but I feel like we get to make things and I don't think sure. everyone does. Um, and we get to make them with people. Yep. Um, so before we talk about that first lesson, I just want to mention as well that the How I Made It Marketing podcast is underwritten by MechLabs Institute, the parent organization of Marketing Sherpa. And to learn how MechLabs services can help you better biz- get better business results from deeper customer understanding, you can visit mechlabs.com slash results. Um, but now let's jump into uh, one of your lessons from, from people you made it with. Uh, partner with a true visionary, which I like. And you said you learned this from working with Anthony Iavone, who is the founder of Augme Tech ad theorent biosymmetrics and a personal friend. So how'd, how'd you learn this from me? Yeah, so it's Anthony Akavone. Uh, he, he's he's going to, he's going to, I could, I could sense the text message coming through right now. <laughs> Still getting it wrong, but um, yeah. yeah, he's a good guy. And I, and I say true visionary because I think, you know, you, you can't just put on the same blue hoodie every single day and same jeans and call yourself an eccentric and, you know, a founder. And I think there's, there's a, there's a certain quirkiness um, and a passion to to these really true visionaries, and I don't even think that they recognize that they have competition. Um, you know, this is somebody that's like, uh, you know, this is the best, and and that's such a uh, you, you could say, hey, that's a that's a weirdo. They don't understand the market, or you could say, I can get on board with this person and learn from this passion. And where I've always fit, um, and I've just kind of identified this as being real to myself is. I partner really well with these visionaries because I can keep them in check. I'm a great go-to-market person. I love this idea, Anthony Akavone, right? I love the fact that you pace around the room and you you do all these, you know, weird things and, and uh, uh, you know, um, but the, keep innovating. Just keep spilling out the ideas and the direction. Let me paper them put them into a process, find out how we get into Kellogg's and, you know, Kimberly Clark. And, and, and those are really rewarding experiences because you find out um, uh, when you're not in a process environment, meaning like somebody like Anthony Akavone, I didn't, when I met him, I, I fell in love with him right away. Cause I'm like, Oh, this guy is great. His ideas are great. And he's weird as hell. I love this. This, this is like, this, this is the guy you read on, you watch on CNBC talking about, you know, billion dollar valuations, you know, three, three years in because he's got this really, really strong vision. And he's, he was talking about, you know, mobile marketing before when we were still flipping our phones open, right. And, and looking for reception. So, you know, I gravitated to that. So that a visionary and what you, for me, the lesson for me was, Hey, I have no guardrails. There's no, there's no COO saying, okay, here's your project management process. Here's your, we had to build from the scratch, from scratch. Not only do we have to build the product, we had to del- build the delivery methodology. We had to build the account management team. We had to build the sales team. We had to build the, um, you know, tech team. And, and, and uh, you want to learn something about yourself with the pressures of a visionary, you do it in that kind of environment, you know, because they're not going to stop and you're either going to keep up um, or you're going to fail. Um, and that's where, you know, I really, you know, I learned so much from him and, and he's just a wonderful, he's a wonderful person. He's a wonderful entrepreneur. He's a wonderful um, friend. Um, but he set a pace for me, um, even at a time when I had my first two kids were itty bitty. I was traveling all around the, you know, I, but I believed in it. And I think if, if you can really have just one opportunity in your career, and I've been so fortunate to have basically a Every single one of them have this same feeling, but I believed in it. You know, you would, you, you would, you would, you know, not die in the literal sense, but you, you, you know, I'm going down with this. We're, we're, we're either going to succeed or we're going to, and I, and I believe in it and I see it work. And that's what I, I, you know, that partnering with that visionary is, 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 is so powerful. Um, and it's, it is, again, it's that reoccurring theme for me of, of people find the right people right and find those mentors that really mean something to you and then believe in you it's always nice to be believed in too right you know you get that phone call in the middle of the night because he would call i'm not sure he ever slept i'm not sure he still <laughs> slept 
Um, but, you know, it didn't matter if it was 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning. I had this great idea. It's a great idea. And, you know, the fact that you'd say, well, dude, I need to sleep for a second. You know, I got infant babies that I'm, we're trying to feed. Um, I need to sleep for a second. But you, but you go, I look in the mirror and go, he's calling me. He believes in me. He believes that his great or kooky idea can be executed through me. I'll take that all day long. He's not. We we had a we had a, you know, general counsel from Harvard. We had the CEO uh, advisor from, you know, a big bank in Silicon Valley. He was calling me. You know, uh, out, out of all the people, so that was, that meant a lot. That helped me get out of this, you know, kind of imposter syndrome and said, hey man, just, just do it. Let's let's just let's just do it. Let's and and uh, and 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 you, you can really believe in it. And you can just, it's it's contagious when you when you when you meet that right person like that. So, I mean, I love what you're saying there about when you're partnering with someone like that to be able to be that operational person that can execute on things. But I also wonder, is there anything that you've learned from him that you've taken on in your career? And I'll give you a quick example. I interviewed Derek DeTenber, the chief marketing and merchandising officer at Batteries Plus on how I made it in marketing. And he mentioned learning from his CEO, just seeing upfront and personal how he was able to press for change, yet keep a calm demeanor, right? And that's something he took with him in his career. Yeah. I wonder if there's something you took in your career, because as marketers, we also need to be those innovators, right? Yeah. But then we need to execute. Yeah, and and yeah, and I take, like I said, I'm I'm a I'm a lesson hound and, and a curious listener. So I got lessons and lessons and um, you know and books and things along those lines. But um, I think from from Anthony, you know, I learned this kind of fearlessness. Right. And, and he didn't see Johnson and Johnson as a, you know, $60 billion conglomerate. He saw it as an opportunity. And I said, we're going to just walk into this place. He's like, yeah, we got kind of a warm intro, but like, what kind of intro are they expecting us? Well, not really, but just follow (laughs) me, you know, and it worked out, you know, it, it worked right. Because we had something good. We knew we had something good. And if you look back at kind of good ideas that failed, it's a lot of times it was because they didn't have that fearless, that fearlessness, right? They didn't get it to enough people or they hesitated or they tried to overcomplicate it. And, and if he saw an opportunity, he just went for it. And sometimes he pushed me first through the door and said, go make it happen. But, you know, he created that fearless, that fearlessness. Uh, And when you believe in it, there's, it's, it's, it's fear, but it's also confidence. Like if I, if I do get this person's ear, you know, if I am sitting with the president of L'Oreal, which we did on a, on a regular basis, um, I bet, I bet we can, I bet we can sell him. I bet we can convince him, you know, because he's going to see this passion and they did. And so that was a great, that was a great lesson of, of kind of that go for it, you know, attitude. If you have something that you really believe in. Well, let's talk about another lesson. So you're kind of talking there about conquering the world and climbing mountains. All these things. <laughs> another lesson you mentioned is we were only as good as how we handle humbling moments. And mm-hmm. you learned this from Charlie Brignac. So I feel like there's probably some painful story behind this. Oh, yeah. Time. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think it, and I tell some younger people that I work with on a regular basis, I, I, I think you have to be humbled on a pretty, uh, you know, you, you should have humbling moments and they're going to happen. Um, I have, you know, quite a few of them because like I said, I didn't have the, the, the best education or the best academic, you know, background. And sometimes it got brought up and, um, Charlie Brignac is, uh, he was the gentleman who came on to Ogme, who got us into these big consumer package, good companies because he was a packaging leader, believe it or not. And we, we, we felt the physical print space was a great place to launch mobile because you could activate through SMS, you could activate through QR codes. I mean, all stuff that people didn't understand back then, uh, but you know, it's kind of normal uh, vernacular now. Um, but we were innovating that, and 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 so he got us through the door. And he's a he's a spiritual guy. He's a gentle, kind person. Um, he 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 loved you, um, and, and if he respected you, you felt you felt amazing. You felt validated. You felt he's just a just a really good person. Again, still somebody that's you know, deep in my life in a, in a good, in a um, good friend. And he's another one who was passionately a believer. You know, he'd go through that door with us on a, on a regular basis. And, and I had a moment where, you know, we, the, like I said, the, the company will be a made for TV um, show at some point. 
It, um, it, it's kind of like maybe uh, The Office meets Games of Thrones meets Jack <laughs> Ryan. I don't know if some, if, if some writer out there, I'll, I'll, I'll do with a data dump for you if somebody can figure out how to uh, put it all together. Um, but as any fast-paced startup, we were growing really big. Um, our covering bank brought in, you know, Paul and Phil. That's all I'll call them. You know, with their suit and ties, and it's like they read the Microsoft manual and walked around the room telling everybody that they're going to be millionaires, and we make everybody millionaires, and that was the first sign that we, we were going the wrong direction. But these guys came <laughs> in and, and um, you know, kind of took over, wanted, the IP, wanted to start suing people who were using our IP as they thought were legal, and, and here we are, you know, deep, deep into Kellogg's and all these big CPG companies, and we're getting agency of record contracts as a... You know, six to 15 person team, you know, the year we signed an agency of record, this is a little side note, but they, the year we signed an agency of record contract with Kellogg's, they, they had 125 agencies on their roster. And because of the recession and sales figure, every, you know, everybody was going through cuts, they consolidated down to 16 and we made the cut. Wow. So that is a champagne popping. <laughs> you know, moment. And these guys just kind of sucked all the fun out of the room because they were like, well, then they have to sign this big legal binding document of, you know, a million dollars a year for our license. And, you know, and if not, we're going to sue them. And, you know, the court of San Francisco, you know, all this kind of stuff was really, um, you know, really upsetting. Well, things got, things got tenser because I'm a, I'm a big equity holder. Anthony Acavone's a big equity holder. Charlie's a big equity holder. Right? We were kind of the, the the original amigos, and we grew this company, and we we felt very passionate about it, and felt passionate about the people we hired, and uh, we were really involved. So things got a little tense. We had a meeting with some key leaders. Charlie was looking at me as the guy who knew everything about the company, the brand, the direction. You know, because Anthony was the visionary, right? So you you weren't going to ask him those questions. And I, f- I let my emotions get ahead of my words. And I, I cursed a little bit. I was a little bit downtrodden. And he pulled me aside after. It was a really important meeting and said, I'm super disappointed in you. And that stung so bad. It yeah. hurt. It hurt. And it and, 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 and immediately was this emotion of, you're right. You brought me here to represent you and me and this company. And, and I had the perfect audience to, to win them over, and I went the wrong way. I, I got my emotions that, you know, ahead of me. We're tired. We're, we're grinding. And, 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 and now you're disappointed in me. That's the worst thing I've ever heard. Worse than the meeting, worse than anything, and and that was a that was a huge huge humbling moment because it was later on in my life too. You know, I'm a dad. Um, you know, we're we're making money. I'm in the press all the time. I felt like I was really kind of rolling along, and then here's a guy that I love like a family member. Say, I'm disappointed in you. That was a terrible performance. Stop with the bad language. You're better than this. Uh, I, you know, I, we need to. We, we need to kind of re, reset, you know, reset. And, and, uh, and, I, and I remind him on a regular basis, you know, that was a big moment. Uh, you know, that was a big moment for me. And it changed, it changed the trajectory of everything. It changed how I lead, changed how I hire, changed how I, I uh, interact with, you know, my team members and, and, uh, and, and other leaders in, in the company for sure. Well, I want to ask about how you lead because uh, I noticed servant leadership on your LinkedIn profile. So one way we learn humility is through painful stories like that, <laughs> those mm-hmm. painful experiences. But also we learn it, there's a positive way, and I'll give you an example real quick of how we learn it just by seeing humble leaders ourselves. And so like, sure. for example, I interviewed Ariel Glassman, the director of marketing at Sage Communications, and one of her lessons was humble leaders provide more than expertise and direction. And she talked about, she works in the federal space and the government space, and she works with military and intelligence leaders. I mean, these mm-hmm. generals and these people that are probably just <laughs> deciding the outcome of our society and our planet on level, levels we probably don't understand, right? And and they were so humble in how they worked with her because she had a specific expertise that she brought in to help them you know, communicate. And now, as they were kind of moving into consulting. So I wonder from your perspective, and how you lead, how do you bring that humility to that leadership in a, in a positive way where, you know, we don't always need that horrible fail story to, to understand yeah. the importance of humility. 
Yeah. Well, I do share stories because I think you 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 have to you have to see people as humans, not as bosses, right? We 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 you know the the servant leader does a lot that goes into the servant leadership culture, but it's not a it's kind of a reverse paradigm, right? So the customer is at the top, you know, not the CEO. So we're not looking up all the time, and and uh, and we we hire along those lines, right? So all of these leaders that are in our organization are just fabulous. They're from different walks of life. They're from different industries and they have great perspective. Um, but they, I, you, you know, you'll know more about them as a human than as a professional before anything. And that's how we've set it up. Right. So we know spouses and husbands and partners and, you know, kids and life and, you know, what are you into and hobbies and, and, and things along those lines before we really know the, the professional person, um, and that, you know, that certainly helps. So, you know, sh- share a lot of stories, you know, have that human um, interaction, but also learn together. I think the the, the thing that we, we try to do is uh, I like I, I'll, I'll be very transparent. I hate I don't want to be a manager. I don't ever want the title. I don't ever want to be a part of it. It's not my style. I want we're a team. You know, uh, I'm not a boss. We're a team. So one of the things that we we try to do is is learn together. Let's let's learn together. This is going to be a very difficult client. For example, right? We know that this is going to be a very difficult client. I am not going to dictate how we do this. Let's do it together. Let's learn from this. Let's build upon these um, you know relationships. We'll read books together. Really specific books that so we um, we are a uh, an NPS till you die organization. So we net promoter score earn patient revenue, all these things that are just really, really innate into our organization. You won't see any of it listed publicly. We're not, it's, it's about our operational uh, per- performance, but you you have to learn, you have to learn on a, on a, on a regular basis. And we, we share failures. We share failures. We sh- on, and, and it's not to chastise anybody. It's not to say, you know, nurse, nurse Daniel, you know, you, you, you guys screwed up again. It's, hey, let's look at, we see three specific components in this experience that we can improve on. And let's do it. You do it. You improve on it. Your scores go up. Things go up. Now, Daniel, we're going to empower you to lead the other seven organizations or seven facilities that are having the same challenges. You know, so now you've gone from having things that you have to fix to now leading how to fix them. So we're constantly empowering, you know, leadership and, and uh, you know, opportunity. And I think um, that really, really, that really helps. And uh, honestly, probably similar to the example that you just gave for your other podcast guests, title has nothing to do with it. There is not a, there's not a, you know, yes, you know, our CFO is an amazing guy i've been as, as a market this is a marketing podcast as a marketer i'm telling you i don't know for all the listening audience i don't know how i got so lucky every single cfo i've ever worked with has been awesome so yeah, i don't <laughs> i know that's not that's not the norm but but it it, it uh, very very collaborative so yeah our cfo is this 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 um has all these great experiences that he brings into it but he's a bigger listener as i am a listener um, as the CEO is a listener. So we're listening, we're learning, and we're empowering on a regular basis. So there's really no hierarchy like, oh, the CEO is talking and we're going to do it you know, this way. And we share the burden. We share burden every day. Volume, you know, performance, we share the burden. You know, we, we are still private equity back and funded. There's a burden to that. If, if anybody listening you know, is in that same organization, you understand that burden. Now, they're not bad people. But it's a burden, and so we're, we share it together. We don't expect the CEO to have all of that burden uh, on it on his uh, shoulders. We, we we share. So that's that's one of the um, the components. And, we, and we're we're big enough now that uh, you know there was some thought that as we I was there was only five of us when I started in 2015. We have over a thousand employees now, um, and we you know we thought could can you scale that kind of culture? And we have been because those leaders are strong. And they're hiring the right leaders. And we will leave a position vacant for longer if necessary. The wrong person creates cancer all the time. It's a 100%, you know, every single time. If you, if you, just, um, if you just accept 
some some mediocrity or the fact that you have to fill a role, uh, it won't work out, uh, and it never has for us. So um, that's that's kind of our philosophy there. Well, let's talk about learning from the wrong person from your perspective. <laughs> uh, so your final lesson here: leadership is not measured in years, but in character. You said you learned this from Lisa. Only Lisa. We're saying only Lisa, only and Lisa. we'll see. We'll see in a minute why. Can you tell us a story about how you learned this? Yeah. So uh, as a as a young uh, as a young buck, um, I went from Viacom International, which was a you know the, the conglomerate owner of of uh, you know Paramount and MTV, and and I was in mergers and acquisitions and worked on the uh, Viacom CBS merger. Um, and then uh, found out that oh, when you do that, you might not have a job. But as you know, a 22 year old, I didn't care. I was like, I'll go back to the beach for an extra extra day. But yeah, so, um, but because of those relationships that I made, and it was just this amazing organization. Again, some mentors there that I met that are still a big part of my life. But they said, hey, go over to CBS. Um, there's a lot of great opportunity for for guys of your skill set and and uh, to, to 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 have a really great career. Went over there. It was probably about a four day transition. And the next thing I know, I'm at you know, CBS. And there's where I met Lisa. Uh, and, and I probably, if I didn't have strong enough morals and character, I probably would have thought the entire world was like Lisa, but you could identify quickly that it, it wasn't. Um, and this was somebody who never led by example, you know, pushing people out the door, um, numbers, 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 you know, you know, those, those kind of things. And, and, uh, and a lot of pressure and she was truly the horrible boss like we when my wife and i um watched horrible bosses the movie for the first time we said this has got like she has to be involved in this somehow <laughs> because she also has and and she was not of uh, jennifer aniston's uh uh makeup let's just say that way and but that's something she would do she would say oh i'm best suited to be played by jennifer aniston so we, we were totally convinced that this was this was her movie that she had uh, she had written but it was it was when you're in the moment you say this is terrible this person's bad they don't have any interest in my performance they don't have any interest in my career they don't have any interest in my growth they're only interested in making their numbers with this little you know, fraction or, or, or a little friction as, as you know possible. But then it's that realization. You step back and you go, "Well, I don't have to do this. I don't have to be a part of this. I don't have to lead this way." And Daniel, what you find out is really the bad people and the bad leaders and the people with bad intentions don't have any longevity. It works out. It works itself out a hundred percent of the time. So yes, it can be painful while you're going through it, but it, there's always an end game to it. If you don't get suckered into it, if you stay, keep, you know, keep your distance, you learn, you, you learn from it. Um, it works itself out all the time. I mean, it, I just I've never not seen it, you know, work out. I have you know plenty of people I network with and friends that you know, say very, you know, similar things, but it's, it's, um, it, you know, it just works itself out. But that was a, it was quite the experience. She, she lives in folklore with, with hundreds and hundreds of, of, of my former, former colleagues. So we hope she's doing well, but, um, we, we, uh, we don't send her Christmas cards. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, well, I think there's some great career lessons there, but I can't help but think like, is there a lesson in how you interact with the customer, right? Because I think customers have the same challenge. You'll see externally, and you mentioned this before too about you know the number of years. You know, some some companies talk about that. You know, you see externally there's a certain brand around something or a certain around the people that work at that brand, but then you can you know have experiences with it. It's horrible. So then you just start thinking, and I mean healthcare specifically too, as we mentioned, like you start thinking like I'm going to have this bad experience there. Yep. So I think like for an example with us, you know. Um, Mech Labs Marketing Sherpa, we have been around since the early days of digital marketing. We do mention that sometimes, but the thing we do more is we try to give customers positive experiences with sure. us. And like, so for one example, we had a copywriting contest with our audience. So, you know, as opposed to saying we've been around since the early days, we know a lot about copywriting. We say, let's do this contest together and let's, you know, kind of learn together and you have that experience from it. And so I wonder, I, I don't, I can't imagine how you could do this in healthcare, but I just want to ask, or maybe some other, you know, industries you've worked in, how do you try to give them some of that experience, you know, 
Beside from saying, hey, we're the oldest brand here, you know, since 1863, yeah. we've had a hospital here, you know, how do you kind of give them a bit of that experience when they've had other negative experiences? Yeah, well, I love that example because we, we, we've we learned that the, the brand promise of these bigger hospitals is, is, is sometimes a lie because there is always that big story or the scripture on the wall, you know, and it's, it's people are, they're reading it, but they're, they're getting more upset because they're not living it while they're there, right? <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. And yeah. that's and that's you know frustrating because I'm sure the the intention is always good, right? I mean, especially those health systems that go back you know a hundred years, and you know, yeah, it was it was to change you know via, create a healthy community, you know, all that stuff. But um, they kind of live by they live by that lie, and that was one of the you know kind of the founding principles of our model was to was to really create a consumer customer service model. And what we needed to do by that is don't let them don't let them leave this experience without feeling that they can provide feedback. So we saw 500,000 patients plus last year. We got 350,000 pieces of feedback um, from those from those patients. Are they all good? No, of course not. Are are a majority of them good? Yes. Um, but we're asking, we're not saying leave us a review. We're asking for feedback. How can we improve this experience? And the greatest part is, is like, like I said, sometimes we see people 15, the same last name 15, 25 times. And they say uh, 10 this time, 9 this time, 10 this time, 5. I was really upset. You know, usually I'm in here and it's, it's, it's great. The, it was a little dirty. Uh, the waiting room i didn't like this new doctor you know that do, do we do we tell him that's just stupid you know that's a stupid observation you know the doctor's fine you know he's he's got he's from notre dame and he's his dad was a no of course not we say call them up we call 100 percent of our patients we we have a whole feedback you know, methodology hey tell tell us a little bit more about your experience uh, you know with, with the the doctor so we can improve for the next time your loyalty is super important. Um, and what's the number one answer we get all the time when we, when we do that? Oh, you read this? Yeah. You, you actually yeah. read the feedback? Yeah, we read 100% of them. We read 100% of them. And, and that really kind of triggers this emotional connection, right? That's what they're not getting at other places. And so we, we really talk, even the toughest consumers, even the... We, you can imagine in healthcare, like I said, we get a lot of people and having bad days, <laughs> bad months, bad years. There's a lot of things going on, um, and we we've heard it all at this point. I mean, we, you know, f you, you're the worst in the world. I hate you. I'm gonna kill you know everything about you. You know, stinks. Hey, we're sorry to hear that. How? What? What part? you know, can, can we improve on what's, you know, how can we help you through this building problem? How can we help you through this? Um, so we really, it's the same interaction that we have in the walls is we're proving to the consumer too. So the same way I'm going to talk to, you know, my, our employees and our clinical staff is the same way I'm going to talk to the consumer like humans who we appreciate. This is something that healthcare doesn't do either. You think about it, you go into the hospital right now, you went to a hospital, any hospital, and your son was totally convinced he was his leg was broken and you go in there and it's not broken and the nurse says he didn't need to be here right that's that's not a negative that's not a positive experience it's a negative experience right we say we're happy you're here how can we help you yes we would have came in too we're concerned too i have i have kids i would have done the same thing as you daniel good you know, good on you for getting in here and getting it checked out. Just transitioning that language and that way we talk to the consumer has changed everything for us. There's a lot of money in that. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of profit in that. There's a lot of loyalty in that. And there's a lot of revenue, um, you know, in that. I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing 70, 80 percent of our first time patients come back within um, 12 months, you know, for, 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 you know, different ailments. And that obviously drives our cost way down as well. So. Well, David, we've talked so much about all these different elements of what it means to be a marketer from the empathy and humility to what you're doing, influencing choice, even in an industry like healthcare. So if you had to break it down, what are the key qualities of an effective marketer? Um, first, I'd say, you know, listen to the consumer, right? So what is what is the market telling you? What is the consumer telling you? What are the challenges that they have? Don't, don't ever ignore that um, by any means. Um, to... 
be a consumer. Um, I love the secret shopper. I love, you know, uh, you know, I love the, 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 uh, I love the opportunity to, to experience a brand. We do it with our own, our own brands all the time, experience the brand, find, find the loopholes, find the, the challenges. And then third is, is, as I said, often is listen, uh, you know, it is so dynamic right now. Um, even in, in something as boring as healthcare and as challenging and, and regulated as healthcare, it's changing every single day. Um, so go to the conferences, go to the webinars, just just learn. If you, if you think you're a SEO expert, listen to another SEO expert. Listen to how their approach is. Just open your, your mind up and your opportunity to, to broaden your, your experiences and get perspective. This totalitarian kind of, I always thought this, maybe it kind of goes back to your fancy terms, missed expectations. There's always this like totalitarian, you know, aspect to like, I've always, I was, came out of the womb as the best marketer on the, on the planet. You know, I came out as, you know, CMO and you, you know, that's not true. Um, you know, and it was this inability to change perspective, right? Is like this way or no way, and I think that's not going to get you in a, in a in a world where these new platforms are emerging every single day. And there is the Anthony Acavones out there in the world that are visionaries, changing the world every day. If you're not paying attention to that pulse, you're, you're going to be you're going to be left you know you're going to be left behind. Um, so I think it's you know listen, learn, attend, ask questions you know ask you know those questions and and uh and collaborate with your collaborate with your competitors uh, you know we we you know we not necessarily here in 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 texas but since i'm involved in this you know healthcare i'm constantly you know uh networking with other healthcare marketing executives that are trying to solve the same problems um yes we are competing for the same patient um but there's no harm in just you know asking the questions be you know, be a good person too. You know, I, you know, I think that, you know, having a, having a cocktail with a competitor and, and, and knowing a little bit about their family and being, you know, kind of involved in their lives and just being a good friend. And, 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 and part, part of that, I think you, um, you broaden so much of, of, uh, your experiences and you may need them at some point in your, in your career as well. I don't think it, it, it hurts the network because you're, you're essentially kind of solving the same problem and you're also feeding your families on, on trying to solve those same problems too so I don't think it hurts to to collaborate anymore especially with this just open network you know flat world now that this this has got us so intertwined with each other well thanks for sharing so much of what you've learned in your career with us today it's just been a pleasure listening to you David yeah pleasure pleasure's all mine this has been a lot of fun Daniel thank you thanks to everyone for listening Thank you for joining us for How I Made It in Marketing with Daniel Burstein. Now that you've gotten inspiration for transforming yourself as a marketer, get some ideas for your next marketing campaign from Marketing Sherpa's extensive library of free case studies at marketingsherpa.com. That's marketing, S-H-E-R-P-A.com.